What is up, you guys, and welcome back to my channel. I am Danielle Hallen, and I'm here to actually update a true crime case for you guys. So I know that so many of us left with a ton of questions after I covered the death of Max Chamberlain. Honestly, it is really, really difficult to cover cases like that where there is little to no media attention whatsoever. There were maybe only one or two articles, only one other podcast covering it, and just bits and pieces of police reports out there. Because like I've said in so many of my videos before, when that is what you have to work with, it just leaves a ton of room for speculation. Typically when I do updates on a case, it's only one or two things. So I'm able to add it really quickly to the description box or, you know, bulk it together in another video in the future. But this time I was actually able to get my hands on the police reports from Max Chamberlain's investigation. And there was so much information in there that I did not have when I originally created a video. So I wanted to create an entire update video for you guys so that all of that information can be out there. So as a brief summary, Max Chamberlain was 24 years old when he passed away in Tempe, Arizona on September 30th, 2017. He fell from the 20th floor balcony of his apartment complex down to the seventh floor pool deck and his death was ultimately ruled a suicide. So basically in this video, I'm going to go through the timeline all over again based on the police reports. So according to police reports, at roughly 3.09 a.m., multiple phone calls started to come in to Tempe 911 claiming that someone had fallen from a balcony at a local apartment complex. Tempe Fire Medical Rescue arrived on the scene at approximately 3.11 a.m. So it was an incredibly quick response time. And according to various reports within the police reports, officers started to respond to the call starting at 3.09 when the call came in. And the first officers arrived on scene at approximately 3.17 a.m. There was actually a pretty large response to this 911 call. So ultimately there were at least 14, I think I may have counted even almost 20 officers officers and deputies that arrived on scene during those early morning hours. And unfortunately at 3.18 a.m. within minutes of the medical rescue arriving on scene, Max Chamberlain was pronounced as deceased and an investigation began. In my original video, we really had no idea at all what the investigation was like from start to finish. Officers Klepp and Adamson were some of the first responding officers that arrived on the scene. And when they arrived at the apartment complex, they were met by a tenant at the front doors right away that was able to use her key fob to escort the two officers to the seventh floor pool deck where they ultimately found Max Chamberlain. Now, right away, Officer Klepp noted in his report that he saw a male face down surrounded by multiple broken framed pictures and a pair of shoes. And he also noted that there were at least 10 other individuals in the immediate area. Now, all of these individuals were people from the apartment complex, so they were obviously considered witnesses and pulled to the side to be interviewed as the scene was being secured. The tenant that had originally let both officers into the building was also one of the individuals that had called 911. This particular witness stated that she was playing games in her apartment with her friends and her balcony doors had been open. While they were playing these games, they heard an incredibly loud thud, so they went outside and that's when they saw a male they didn't recognize face down on the pool deck. So they immediately called 911. They told police that they didn't fit physically see him fall and they also didn't go anywhere near his body. They just panicked and called 911. Another witness was questioned by officer Medina, who was a bike officer and also one of the first that was on the scene. Now this particular witness stated that they were in their apartment on tower two when he and his roommate heard some female scream from a balcony on tower one, which is right across the way. Hey, is that a person? Almost as soon as this individual screamed this out, these two men in the apartment heard a loud thud. They immediately ran out to the balcony and looked over to see someone on the pool deck below. They frantically ran down, hoping that they would be able to help this individual. But when they realized the state that his body was in, they instead just called 911. Both of these witnesses also confirmed they didn't touch a thing on the scene, and they actually were the first two to arrive down on the pool deck. Officer Adamson continued to interview the different witnesses down on the pool deck. One witness stated that he 
was on the patio of his apartment when he actually looked out and saw something that looked like a body flying through the air. When he realized he had in fact seen a body fall through the air, he immediately went to security to try to alert them to what he had seen. As soon as he told security, he himself also headed to the pool deck. He told authorities that this incident happened maybe three to five minutes before the first responders began to arrive, which makes sense because the call was made at 3.09 and EMS showed up at 3.11. Now this witness also claimed to not have seen this person fall, what balcony they fell from, but based on where they were in their apartment, they believed it had to have been somewhere between the 18th and the 25th floor. This witness also stated that they didn't know the victim and hadn't heard or seen anything unusual at all before witnessing him falling through the air. Adamson then interviewed yet another witness that said that they didn't see the incident, but they did see the body on the pool deck, and and they called 911. He did state, however, that he thought it was possible his girlfriend may have actually seen this person fall, but unfortunately he had no clue where she was, so he handed police over her phone number, but I have absolutely no idea if they were ever able to get in contact with her. The one thing that shocked me in the original video that I think I stated was that there didn't seem to be any witnesses whatsoever. It didn't seem anyone was questioned. I just couldn't understand how there was this, you know, college-based apartment complex and no one heard or saw a thing. But their police reports show that there were actually quite a handful of people who were all sitting out on their balconies that night. None of them saw or heard anything other than all of a sudden seeing Max Chamberlain falling to his own death, which I'm sure was incredibly traumatizing for a lot of these individuals. Now, as all of these witnesses are being questioned, Officer Adamson was very quickly informed that someone had just come off the elevators at the seventh floor pool deck, claiming that they believe this victim may in fact be their boyfriend. At this point, Officer Adamson walked over and this is when he first came in contact with Max Chamberlain's girlfriend as she came off the elevator. She had frantically tried to run over to see if this individual on the pool deck was Max, but she was stopped before she could get over there. She briefly told Officer Adamson that they had been dating for five years. They had lived in this apartment complex together so far for only two months. They really didn't know anyone in the area yet. They both had just started to attend ASU. She immediately told police that Max was not suicidal, at least not to her knowledge. He had never made any statements to her regarding wanting to end his own life. He had never even mentioned being depressed before. She told Officer Adamson that that night they had been drinking and that Max decided he wanted to smoke marijuana. This started an argument between Max and his girlfriend because she wasn't happy that he was smoking. According to her, Max did not normally smoke. It was not something that he enjoyed doing. And according to her, he allegedly had a few episodes in the past when he would smoke and drink at the same time that were kind of similar to what she claimed his behavior was that night. She said that after Max smoked some marijuana that he just kept on smoking. And according to her, as soon as he finished, he started freaking out. And in his own words, he was tweaking. Now, while this argument is going on and Max is allegedly tweaking and freaking out, Max's girlfriend went out onto the patio and had a brief phone conversation. And she claimed that during this phone call, she could hear Max inside breaking and smashing things. She had made him a cake that he smashed. Um, I think there was some like ASU wall art that he had smashed. And when she entered back into the apartment, Max told her that he needed to leave. He said he was freaking out and he had to go, to which she agreed. At this point, she told Officer Adamson she went straight to their bedroom. And when she did this, she thought she heard Max grab the keys. She told Officer Adamson that she stayed in the bedroom for about 15 minutes and then decided to go and check on Max. And at this point, she just assumed that he was sitting outside in the hallway. But when she walked out of the bedroom, she noticed that the balcony door was open and she saw a broken item on the patio. She decided to walk out on the balcony and when she looked over the edge is when she saw a body down on the patio below. Meanwhile, Officer Klepp, Officer Payne, and Officer Hansen decided to go up to the victim's potential apartment. They knocked on the door a handful of times. There was no response. The door was unlocked. They decided to go ahead and go in to do a welfare check and to sweep the apartment 
apartment for any other occupants. Officer Klepp right away found that there was a wallet on a dresser just behind the couch. And when he looked into the wallet, he found Max's ID in it. He realized that this in fact did match the victim on the pool deck below. At this point, Officer Hansen was left to secure the entire apartment. They wanted to shut all of it down as a crime scene and he was left to stand as scene security. So no one went in or out of the apartment. By 4.20 a.m., so about an hour after police first arrived, Matthew Jones, the lead investigator that had been chosen, arrived on scene. And he confirmed when he arrived, according to his reports, that an incident boundary had in fact been established. They were making sure that no one was going in and out of the crime scene, which was the seventh floor pool deck and the apartment that belonged to Max Chamberlain. Um, they also were already starting an evidence list. And he was also given a briefing prior to making his own observations on the scene. In his report, he noted that Max was not wearing a shirt or shoes. He only had on a pair of green sweatpants and then under the green sweatpants were a pair of blue shorts. Underneath of Max himself, there was also a pair of Levi's and a pair of green shorts. And it was noted that based on their positioning, it seemed like he had been holding them when he fell. There were three broken picture frames surrounding Max's body. I think they were like two feet or so away from one of his shoulders. And there was also a pair of black tennis shoes about three to four feet away from Max's head. There was also some random green leafy potted plant near his body. Picture frames that he had were pictures of he and his girlfriend. Officer Justin Sheriff was the one that was remaining with Max's girlfriend as her mother ended up arriving on scene. They immediately separated the two of them, taking Max's girlfriend's mother down to the lobby. Now, once they were separated, Officer Sheriff interviewed the girlfriend's mother, just like a very quick brief questioning. She told Officer Sheriff that she had been with Max that night and he seemed completely fine. The only thing she could think of was that he made a very brief comment about not being incredibly happy with school at the moment. But other than that, nothing seemed odd. About an hour after this, while the investigation was ongoing, at 5.20 a.m., Detective James Welling then went to interview the girlfriend's mother himself down in the lobby and got a little bit more of the story. So according to police documents, she said that she had absolutely no knowledge whatsoever of Max being suicidal at any point. She had never heard him say anything. She had never heard her daughter say anything, which corroborates exactly what Max's girlfriend had said when she initially came down off of the elevator. She again mentioned that he had briefly made a comment that night about not liking school. She elaborated saying that he also mentioned not really enjoying his job, but he immediately followed this up saying that he was possibly going to start working at a company that was very similar to his father's company where he loved to work when he was back at home. So while he did make this kind of brief, strange comment about not being happy, it wasn't anything incredibly alarming and he followed it up with something positive. She then went on to tell Detective Welling that at 3.14 a.m., which would have been just a few minutes after the first responders arrived at 3.11, she received a very frantic call from her daughter from Max's cell phone. Detective Welling was able to look at her phone log and confirm the time of this phone call and that the call lasted for three total minutes. She said that the entire call, or at least majority of it, her daughter was hysterical. Two of the three minutes, she just repeatedly was screaming mom into the phone. And then after this, she began to yell or at least seemingly yell at someone else else saying, is he okay? Over and over and over again. She then said something to her mother about Max smoking and then something about he took off. At that point, she told her mom, you need to come here and the phone call ended. Not understanding what was going on or why her daughter was so frantic, she attempted to call her back two times after this, but there was no answer. Her mom then mentioned that she had heard a story about Max smoking marijuana and having a really bad reaction in his senior year of high school when he was on spring break in Mexico. She said she had absolutely no idea what exactly happened. She had only briefly heard of this, but I guess that was the first thing that came to her mind when Max's girlfriend was freaking out saying that Max had smoked. After this interview at 5.51 a.m., Detective Welling then went on to interview Max's girlfriend, and this is her second interview. Max's girlfriend, according to police reports, confirmed that she had in fact been at her mom's house that night with Max. And she also began to elaborate a little more on her story. She said that on the way home, they had stopped at a drive through liquor store and they had grabbed a bottle of Tito's. She again stated that they were drinking when they got home, watched a movie and that Max asked to smoke. She said that he didn't typically smoke and that he only asked her because it was hers. It was something she had purchased for herself. And then shortly after this, he began to start saying that he was tweaking and that he needed to leave. She again states at this point that she went to the bedroom and thought she heard him grab the keys. 
She confirmed that Max had in fact had some sort of strange experience after smoking marijuana on spring break in high school, but she herself wasn't there. But she was also able to say that there had been a handful of times since then that Max had in fact smoked. It was nothing frequent. He just occasionally had smoked since then and that nothing like this had happened before. She also stated that she couldn't think of any reason at all that Max would jump. She also told police that she had purchased marijuana that they smoked that night from someone that she trusted and someone that she had purchased from before. And she never stated that she felt any adverse reaction to this marijuana, indicating it could possibly be laced with something or potentially synthetic. After the second interview, Max's girlfriend signed a consent to search form and gave police access to her keys so that they could get into the apartment. Now, something I was super hung up on in my original video and one of the biggest questions I had, something that was just so suspicious to me, was the fact that Max's girlfriend, according to the information I had then seemed to call her mom before calling police. And that's just not something you would have expected someone to do. I, you would think the first reaction would be immediately call police for help. But now that I was actually able to sit down with the police reports, it makes a whole lot more sense once you have the timeline. It was confirmed by Detective Welling that this phone call from Max's girlfriend to her mother was at 3.14 a.m. That is three minutes after the first responders arrived. So at the point in which she would have looked over the balcony edge to see someone she believed possibly be Max on the ground, there were these 10 witnesses that police noted when they first arrived on scene. There were the first responders that were already there um, working on him. And by the time the phone call was over, he was being pronounced dead and the police officers were trickling in. And there were like at least eight that all arrived at the same time. So while initially I did think it was super suspicious that she didn't call police, she probably just didn't call police because police were already there. Now, after getting the consent to search at 6.16 a.m., lead investigator Matthew Jones and a few other detectives went up to Max's apartment. It was noted that there was food on the kitchen floor, um, on the counter, bottles of alcohol were in the living room and right by the patio door. There was also a container they found that appeared to be filled with marijuana, by the couch along with different types of drug paraphernalia. During the rest of their search, they obviously ended up out on the patio and they were able to find that the railing itself measured at about four feet high, which is decently high. But they also noted that an ottoman, a piece of their patio furniture was kind of placed right next to the railing. And right next to this ottoman was a shattered piggy bank. At this point, the interior of the apartment was photographed along with the patio and the view from the patio and all evidence was collected. At 6.20 a.m., investigator Rayner with the Maricopa County Medical Examiner's Office arrived and by 8.38, a preliminary examination was done on Max Chamberlain's body and it was concluded at that point that there were no signs of foul play. During this time, the scene was also mapped and measured and Officer Paul Alenius was tasked with checking all of the floors between 7 and 20 in the direct line that Max fell. He had a few different abrasions on his back and on his chest and they believed this could have been from potentially hitting one of the railings on his way down. So they wanted to check all of those different apartments that he would have fallen by for any evidence of damage or just evidence at all. Tenants from four apartments answered and no damage or evidence was located, but unfortunately tenants from another eight apartments did not answer the door and so they were not able to check for anything. At this point, Max was taken to the Maricopa County Forensic Science Center for further examination and by 8.38, Tempe police left the scene. So at this point, it's filled in a lot of the gaps. I really could not understand how no one in this college community was out on their balconies and saw or heard anything. Now we know that there were actually multiple people who were out on their balconies and not a single one of them claimed to have heard anything odd or seen anything odd. It's also very interesting to hear the different things that were found with Max at the time that he fell. He had no shirt on, he had no shoes on, clearly he had grabbed some shoes, um, you know, but why was he bringing two other pairs of pants? Why did he have these pictures of him and his girlfriend? I don't understand why there was a potted plant. Why was the piggy bank? broken. There's just still so many questions as to why he would have had this odd collection of items with him. On October 1st, the following day, Detective Jones stated that Max either intentionally or accidentally fell based on all of the evidence they had collected and what the medical examiner originally believed was the case. And there was no foul play suspected by the medical examiner. He did still state that the case was still open and pending until the medical examiner concluded their findings. There was a toxicology report that had to be done, a full forensic examination, now, I will say I didn't see any other documents between when this was written on October 1st um, and when the ME results came back in and I believe the end of December, I didn't see that any more investigative 
of action was taken, which I find kind of odd just because they were stating it was still an open investigation. I don't see any evidence that they attempted to collect any footage from the apartment complex. I still don't see that they tried to get anything from nearby apartments or parking decks. At this point, they didn't have any eyewitnesses at all that actually saw what happened when Max came off of the balcony. So you would think that they would have wanted to gather any of that that they possibly could because it was still an ongoing investigation. But it seems like at that point, they just sat back and waited for the ME to come back with results instead of kind of rolling through the motions, which I had already stated in my previous video. And on December 29th, 2017, the ME results came back. So the ME report concluded that Max died due to trauma from the fall and his manner of death was listed as suicide, which was already known and stated in my previous video. We also already know that the toxicology report did not show that there was marijuana in his system, which was one of the most baffling things considering it was claimed by his girlfriend that he had been smoking mass amounts of marijuana. And this is what led to his kind of freak out and him allegedly tweaking. I wasn't able to get a copy of the toxicology report or the ME report as a whole, but in the police reports, it directly says that while there was no marijuana found in his system, they did find cocaine and Adderall. On January 4th, 2018, just a few days later, Max's family was notified of the ME results and had obvious questions about this lack of marijuana in his system. Because that fact alone just does not corroborate the story that had been told by Max's girlfriend. So Detective Jones, according to the police report, decided to reach out to the toxicologist to ask why there would be no cannabinoids found in his system, despite this claim that he had been smoking marijuana. There had never been any mention that night from his girlfriend or any witnesses about Adderall, use or cocaine use or anything like that. So they were not even sure what to do with that information yet. Now, according to toxicologist Tanya Mitchell, there are one of two possibilities. And one of them was actually brought to my attention almost immediately after the fact, and I didn't even know this was a thing. So first and foremost was something that I'd already gone over, the idea that it was possibly synthetic marijuana. This was mentioned to Max's father. However, we have Max's girlfriend stating that she trusted the individual she got this marijuana from. Um, the officer allegedly told Max's dad he didn't believe it was synthetic marijuana. Max's girlfriend also smoked this marijuana and she didn't have any adverse reactions, but that could could be a reason why it wasn't picked up. If it somehow, after all of that, still managed to be synthetic marijuana, that would not come up in a urinalysis. But the second reason, the one that was brought to my attention afterwards, is that if he had consumed this marijuana within 30 minutes of his death, it would not have shown up in his toxicology report, which I had no idea about that. So apparently, according to this toxicologist, if you do not frequently smoke marijuana, there is not going to be a buildup of it enough to where it would be seen in a urinalysis. Um, it would not have had enough time to go through his system in a way it would have been picked up. So if he had smoked within that 30 minute time frame, it wouldn't have shown up on the toxicology report, which means it's totally possible that he did in fact smoke marijuana that night. He just did it right before his death. However, in the same breath, he also had Adderall and cocaine in his system, which could explain the bizarre behavior in itself. At this point, because there were so many strange things going on, there was a follow-up investigation. Part of this investigation actually brought forward a direct eyewitness, which I was not aware there was one. So on February 13th, 2018, Detective Jones was reached out to by the leasing manager at the apartment complex. She left Detective Jones a message stating that she had information she believed to be crucial to their investigation. Unfortunately, this interview was not recorded. I don't know why it wasn't recorded, but according to Detective Jones' report after the fact, the leasing manager stated that shortly after Max's death, she was approached by a tenant. And this tenant lived in the opposite tower from Max. And, and he said that he witnessed Max jump. Now, up to this point, people had seen Max fall through the air. People had heard him fall but not a single witness had physically seen Max go over the balcony. Leasing manager reported to Detective Jones that this tenant seemed very visibly upset and traumatized by what he had seen. And subsequently, he ended up moving out of the apartment that fall semester. So she gave Detective Jones his contact information so that he could go and ask more follow-up questions. At this point, Detective Jones and the leasing manager then went up to these two separate units, 
the one that the tenant had lived in, the witness, and the one that Max lived in. Detective Jones stood in the tenant's apartment and the leasing manager stood in Max's apartment. They both went out on the balconies and there was a very clear line of sight between that tenant's apartment and Max's. And they were able to take digital photographs to confirm this. So it seemed very plausible that had this person been out on their balcony that they very easily could have seen Max fall over. The following week, Detective Jones managed to get in contact with this tenant and interview him. Now, this tenant stated that that night he was having a party at his apartment. He decided at some point to briefly head down the hall to a neighbor's apartment. Unfortunately, couldn't recall the unit number. I don't know if he even was able to hand over this individual's name, but he did say that this unit was actually even closer to Max's unit than his own. So it would have been a better view, I guess you could say. He was out on this neighbor's balcony and they both were drinking when he looked up and he saw an individual walk out onto the balcony to the patio railing, this individual being Max. He then saw Max look over the balcony and then Max immediately walked backwards back into the apartment and grabbed a few things in his hands before running towards the balcony and jumping over. According to this witness, Max's foot kind of clipped the balcony railing going over and so it sent him kind of toppling forward over the balcony. This witness then stated that after a few minutes, they saw someone looking through a window to the right of the patio and police were able to confirm that this was in fact Max and his girlfriend's bedroom. So first of all, this was the only eyewitness they had so far that saw Max go over the balcony. And according to him, there was no one around him at the time he went over. This was incredibly important. And I am honestly a little bit shocked that this information is not out there somewhere. However, one thing the tenant did say to Detective Jones was that he had 20-70 vision, which is not the best vision in the world. He was not wearing any sort of corrective lenses or glasses at the time. And he'd also had one to two alcoholic drinks that night. Since there was no unit number that he could remember to give police, the unit number of this neighbor, they were not able to go back and confirm for a second time that there was a clear line of sight between where the tenant actually was and the apartment. So their view from his apartment to Max's didn't really matter at this point because that's not where he saw Max fall. It was all reliant on this witness saying that the balcony that he was on was actually closer to Max's and still had a clear view. Now, if I'm being quite frank about this, um, I have no clue why this person did not come forward at all to speak with authorities about what they saw. I feel like there's no way that this tenant witnessed Max jump over the balcony and then didn't have some sort of reaction to it. Um, I don't know if maybe they just stood there watching after the fact. I don't know if police have attempted to contact this person he was drinking with to see if they saw anything. Maybe he didn't come forward and say anything because he thought someone else possibly witnessed it. If he saw tons of people down there, maybe he thought that another person didn't need to add to the chaos. It also was probably incredibly traumatizing to witness something like that. So maybe that comes into play. I'm sure that afterwards, tons of people were talking um, and there was a lot of speculation going around about what happened. So I feel like at that point, I'm surprised he didn't come forward to say anything. And then on top of that, according to her own statement, the leasing manager didn't come forward until four months after Max's death. And according to her own statement and the police reports shortly afterwards is when this tenant came to her with this information. So to me, I just can't understand why this information was known. And first of all, not brought forward right away to police. And second of all, it is not known to anyone publicly until I saw these police reports and I'm now putting it out there. On February 15th, 2018, during this follow-up investigation, after finding out that there was actually an eyewitness that saw Max alone jump over the railing. The police department again brought in uh, Max's girlfriend to question her. Now, the girlfriend was interviewed by Detective Jones at the Tempe Police Department. She went into more detail about what happened that night in their relationship. She admitted to police during this interview that her and Max did have several domestic incidents during their relationship, particularly when they were under the influence. And she admitted to striking or scratching Max a handful of times during those incidents, but was very adamant to state that he had never once put a hand 
turned on her. She said that the particular night of the incident that they had actually taken Adderall prior to leaving her mom's house. So that does explain the Adderall in the system. Now, when asked about the cocaine found in his system that night, she said that she herself had no idea that he had used cocaine. However, she stated that after the fact, it was brought to her attention through one of Max's friends that I believe around two in the morning, so about an hour before the police were called, Max sent a Snapchat to one of his close friends that showed him with a usable amount of cocaine. She told police that when Max would buy cocaine, he would usually buy about an eight ball at a time and that it also wasn't uncommon for him to buy and use cocaine without telling her. So, so far that night we have him drinking alcohol. He also took Adderall and he also used cocaine. He also told police that that night after they left her mother's house, they were detained at a traffic stop where Max had to do a couple of sobriety tests before he was released. Detective Jones was in fact able to corroborate that on the night of the 29th, only 15 minutes after leaving his girlfriend's mother's house at 11.14 p.m., Max was in fact stopped and he was given a handful of these sobriety tests and was eventually let off with a warning for failure to drive on the correct side of the road. Clearly there was something going on. So in order to corroborate this cocaine story, because you know no one knew he had any cocaine in the system or mentioned it until it was found in his talk screen, Detective Jones then went on to contact Max's friend that he had sent the Snapchat to. He confirmed that he had received the Snapchat at around 2 a.m. and that after that, he didn't hear from Max again. Unfortunately, Snapchat being the way it is, uh, there is no longer this photo available for anyone to share with detectives. I'm sure they could probably get a warrant if they really wanted to, to get it, but no one had it on hand. After the follow-up was completely done and finalized, Detective Jones stated that he was able to clear up the discrepancy when it came to the marijuana not being found in a system, which was one of the most suspicious things. I don't know if there's any way to really confirm either way it could have gone. But as I said, regardless, he did have two other drugs in his system at the time. On top of that, there's now an eyewitness, which is a huge change and shift in information. And also the Snapchat photo confirming that Max was in fact seen with cocaine that night at about 2 a.m. an hour before he started freaking out and went over the balcony. With all of that together, Detective Jones stated that the findings are exactly the same. They had nothing at all to suggest foul play. Um, and on March 29th, 2018, the case was closed. And this is exactly why I made an entire video on this because it wasn't just tiny things that changed. It was pretty large ones. Without the police reports, we never would have known the fact that there was in fact an eyewitness, that there were two other kinds of drugs in his system. We're able to get a more accurate and solid timeline, uh, make sense of this girlfriend's phone call to her mom instead of the police. There were just so many things that I particularly felt so off about in my original video that got answered and they needed to be addressed. I still stand by the fact that I think the police department should have done a handful of things to make sure that there wasn't room for a ton of speculation. The police department did do tons of interviews. They spoke to the witnesses there, but I wish they had gone back and gone to all of those different apartments underneath Max's where tenants didn't answer that early morning. Go and just double check that there's no evidence there. I also wish they had gone and checked surveillance footage so that it wasn't this four month waiting period to see if someone had actually physically seen that Max himself jumped and there was no one else on the balcony with him. Without certain stones, unturned, you're just leaving space for the speculation to be there. And while some of those things may seem small, for instance, also where were his keys? Were his keys ever even located? I still have that question and it may seem insignificant, but you know, when it comes to a family understanding what has happened to their loved one and people that were all involved, having those small things go unanswered can lead to nightmares for everybody. Losing someone from an accident or from homicide, um, losing someone to suicide, it's never ever going to be easy. And that's going to bring up a ton of emotions in a lot of people. And I feel if police are the ones who ultimately get to have the final say on how the particular case is classified, it is their obligation and duty to make sure they answer all possible questions. No one should have to defend themselves against accusations. No family should have to feel like they have to investigate the death of their own 
loved one. I'm honestly incredibly happy that I managed to get the police reports from this particular case because the original information that I had felt incredibly suspicious. And there were so many things that were topics of the most interest and concern for me that could have easily been answered had I had these initially. As a true crime YouTuber, it is my obligation to get as much information, accurate information as possible out there to you guys. I never want to sway you guys any particular way. I try my hardest to remain as unbiased as possible. And the nature of these cases is that sometimes we don't have all of the information. These cases don't stop when my video ends information still is out there. There are things that we still don't know. There are lives that we personally haven't lived. I just want to make sure that my channel remains a place where we can continue these conversations and add to the information that we do have and remain with an open mind because these are people's lives that we're speaking about. On that note, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and go. Thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and listen to this update with me. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below to become a part of the Howland fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together or bring them justice together and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.